afternoon and welcome to this week's Sunday Night Live, the automotive show where we talk about all things automotive, variable ops, fixed ops, it has to do with the dealership and the car world. Uh, I bring on the experts that, um, that live in the space to share with us what they know and what they do that makes the dealer successful. And I'm very excited today because I've got none other than the one and only David Boyle. President of Tire Profiles. This is a guy that knows a lot about the tire business and the reason you guys should get into the tire business because it's your number one retention tool. Now, some of you know David, some of you don't. So without any further ado, David, welcome to the show, man. Hey, Paul, how you doing? Great to be here. Right. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about you, how you got started in the car business and how, how you got to this point. That's that's a good question. I it's funny. I'm I, I do a podcast every month, and I'm actually just finished recording one for next month and answered that exact question. Yeah, I'm one of these sort of accidental car business guys. I didn't uh, I didn't intend on getting into this business. That wasn't my wasn't going to be my chosen profession. I I uh, but I, I was always into cars, and uh, at a very early age, I got interested in motorsports and went down that path for better part of two decades. Um, actually got kind of a late start in the business, if you will. Um, you know, because of that, I raced professionally from uh, the time I was 16 till in my mid twenties. So about 10 years um, I raced professionally and quickly realized one of my more powerful life lessons when you're not good enough at something you should stop. And uh, I realized uh, in my mid twenties, as as I was uh, not winning enough to maintain sponsorships and stuff like that, that uh, it was time for me to pick a different chosen profession. And I'm glad that I did. So, um, but I, I actually leveraged relationships that I had with GM at the time. I was a factory uh, GM driver um, up in Canada where I grew up. Um, ran a number of different sports car series up there with GM sponsorship, and I knew a bunch of people at GM. Um, in Canada at the Oshawa Manufacturing Plant and where GM's headquarters are and leveraged relationships there to sort of get into the business. And uh, um, ironically, my first job, though, was was looking for I looked for a specific company to go to work for um, and tried for a while to get someone at that company to talk to me. And again, this was a long time ago, Paul, you and I are about the same age. So um, this was pre the Internet and you know, pre-texting and, uh, you know, we still uh, did everything the old fashioned way, so to speak. And I was having some difficulty getting in touch with the guy that I was trying to get in touch with. And then lo and behold, one night I saw an ad for this company in the newspaper. Yes. Back in those days, we used to look for work in the newspaper. Um, and I applied for a job. No, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, you must have all this experience working in dealerships and they were looking for a trainer slash consultant. And of course, I didn't have any of that experience, but I loved cars. And and the guy at GM that you know I took some advice from said that this was a, an up and coming company and I should, I should look into it. And uh, lo and behold, I was very lucky to get the job. Uh, like I said, I had no, um, no experience whatsoever, but I must have said something right in the interview. Um, and that company was called NewGen. Um, and they were headquartered in headquartered in Markham, Ontario, which wasn't too far from where I grew up. And the CEO of that company was none other than Mr. Les Silver, who yeah. most people in the industry know. Um, and that started a 20 plus year career uh, of mine with Les, working with Les, um, for Les um, in a number of different companies um, over the years. Um, really is my mentor in this business and he likes to say he taught me everything he knows. I think I learned a few things on my own, but uh, I certainly did learn a lot from him um, over the years and, and got a, a great opportunity to uh, to run a couple of companies for him, um, most notably MPI, which was, as most people know, was the company that sort of pioneered the digital inspection space. Um, and um, had, had a great run with that company until that company got sold. And then like so often happens in these, this business, when things get sold, people change around. And uh, 
had an opportunity to uh, to uh, get involved with Tire Profiles, um, and it's the first company that sort of is my own that uh, that I had a chance to uh, to uh, you know be the CEO and, and run this company myself, uh, and uh, jumped at the opportunity to to come on board with with my partner and and run this business. And uh, uh, I think it's been eight years now, and it's been great. Uh, we're we're uh, we're trying to really do some some special things in the automotive industry as they pertain to tires, like you said. I don't I don't know if I'm a tire expert per se. Um, I've, I've, a lot of people give me that moniker, and I'm not sure it's completely accurate. I I, I do know a lot about this industry. Uh, I've spent the better part of 30 years in it. Um, on the service side only, uh, I tell people that I couldn't tell you how to sell a car to save my life. Um, I actually don't find that side of the industry interesting. A lot of people do. A lot of people find showrooms sexy. I find service departments sexy. Um, I think the people on that, on the, on the fixed side are, are what's interesting about the business. And I just love, you know, the fixed side of the business and spent my entire career there. Um, and, you know, my involvement with tire profiles was, I was one out of necessity, actually. I, I, when the necessity for the industry, um, one of the last things I did before I left MPI was I was did a bit of a research internal research project on tire and in, tire inspections as a function of a multi point inspection, and found some very interesting and disturbing data um, that that sort of sent me you know down the path of trying to figure out how to help dealers get better at selling tires because some of the statistics that I had seen and some of the data that I had gleaned from the literally tens of thousands, if not millions of inspections that MPI was doing at the time told me that this was the next great opportunity for car dealers uh, and that they didn't get serious about it, that, uh, that it was going to be a real problem. So uh, that's sort of how I got started and how I ended up where I am now. Wow. That's one hell of a story, man. We got a Thank few you. comments on the side here. So let me get caught up on those. Tully Williams says, hello, all. Hello, Tully. <laughs> Joe Brawler. Hi, everyone. Mark Williamson. Hey, guys. Michael Larkin from Hartford here. Hey, I thought you were West Hartford. Abel Aguirre says, howdy, y'all. Mike Vogel. Hi, everyone. Smiling face emoji. Steve Chesson. The, hmm, the COVID emoji, I think that one is. <laughs> Michael Landis says hello, Paul and David. John Frazier, let's talk about tires and not the spare tire around my waist. LOL. <laughs> Ron Usher says hello, gentlemen. Mike Vogel. Tully says it's all about the hours. Mike Vogel says it's all about the tires, which leads to the hours. Smiling face emojis. Love you, Tully. Tully says it's repeat and referral. John Frazier says bringing sexy back. Yeah, John Frazier's got some interesting stuff that, that we're going to be talking about. Um, Mike Vogel says, Tully, yes, sir, you are correct as always. Repeat and referral helps get the hours we need to be successful. Joe Brawler says, Mike Vogel, fixed office coach with the fixed ops coach with the punching emoji. Tully says, amen, my brother. And Russ Mann says, hello, everyone. <sighs> That's a lot. But I hate there you go. There you go. Oh, Michael Larkin says, West Hartford, you're right. Huh. I know where the guy lives more than he knows where he lives. And Victoria Getaway says, hi, y'all. We got some Southerners on here tonight. So I, like you, uh, started in this business way back when. And um, we didn't know anything about the computer at that time. We Everything was a handwritten RO. Big stacks of ROs all stapled together at the end of the day. You know, everything mm -hmm. was on paper. So, yeah, it certainly come a long way. And um, now, particularly, tires are so crucially important because, let's face it, the cars are made a lot better than they were decades ago. So the service opportunities are minimal. And I think I watched uh, one of your videos. Actually, I watched all of your videos on your website. And it talks about the defection point, which typically aligns with the end of the warranty, which aligns with when the people need tires. And having been an aftermarket guy, I ran several MITA shops. I uh, was in the top 15% of all of, of some 1,800 stores across the country. So we got very good at taking the dealer's business, swapping out 
the tickets. And once they once they go to the aftermarket, folks, they're not coming back. They're not coming back. So um, you let me know when you want to play the the video, um, and you know talk to us no, about. We, yeah, yeah, we can play the video whenever. But I I can talk to it. I mean, I I. I, I go to sleep at night and I hear that video. I've heard it so many times. So, uh, but, um, you know, listen, I, I, I want to address something that, that Tully said, because, you know, he and I have been friends for a long time and, and, you know, this business is about hours, right? I mean, that's what drives the revenue is selling hours, but, and, and I know Tully doesn't disagree with this. What makes up those hours is what's critical. You got to have them and you got to have lots of them, but what makes up them is critical. And one of the things that I mentioned, I mentioned at the end of my career with MPI, I, I looked at some, some t statistics and data and the, the thing that I looked at and the thing that was alarming to me was, you know, we had a 10 year run at MPI and towards the last couple of years, the number of legitimate things that were being found on multi-point inspections had almost reached zero. And I want to, I want to put some background to that. And I really hope that I'm not going to offend anybody that is in the chemical business that's potentially listening or on the line with us. But what I mean by legitimate things is the things that were being found in the tail end of my career with, with MPI were what I call manufactured needs, things that were upsell items that technicians were recommending, things like flushes and, and transmission services and power steering services and stuff like that. And I'm not going to debate whether those things are needed or not. Some people believe in them. Some people don't. Um, you know, I take the high road and flushes. Yeah, I take the high road and don't have an opinion. So because I, I can, but but I will tell you that a lot of consumers don't necessarily believe in them. And that what's what's what what what's empower important about what I'm going where I'm going with this is that when when I started with MPI, we averaged four point two items, legitimate items per inspection. At the tail end, we were under one. Wow, that is a an alarming statistic that drives hours, that drives everything that we do in this business. And the sort of revelation, if you will, that I had was wh where is the dealer's next opportunity going to be in service to look for work, um, it legitimately needed work outside of things like uh, oil services and flushes and things of that nature, and. That's what sort of led me down this path of tires because it is the single largest, biggest opportunity of magnitude that the dealers have. They currently have the new car dealers. This is industry statistics now. The new car dealer typically has, statistically has between six and 7% of the tire replacement market. So if you think about that, dealers sell all the new cars but we're only replacing 6% of the tires that are out there. That's an, another alarming statistic that's driven by what you just said, which is defection. By the time the customer needs tires, they're gone. Yeah. And, you know, we do things. I had an interesting conversation with a buddy of mine a couple of weeks ago as a service director here in Dallas, at one of the larger Cadillac dealers. And we were talking about, you know, the things that we do in the first couple of years and the things that we discount and give away and the things that we do in order to try to maintain and retain that customer for the later years when ultimately that vehicle's eventually, I should say that vehicle's gonna have more miles on it and they're gonna start spending a bit more money. So, you know, we're betting on the come that never comes. Right. Okay, these people are gone. And, you know, whether you look at, at you know, if you've in the video that you're referring to, I show a chart in that video that is commonly referred to in our industry as the waterfall chart. Every OE has produced this chart. And basically, it shows from zero miles to 150,000 miles. It shows the drop off in service retention over miles. And the it's called the waterfall chart because the when the drop starts, it's dramatic. 
It's almost vertical. Um, and it's in that period of about 35,000 miles to about 45,000 miles. And we in the industry have always assumed correctly, by the way, that one of the drivers or the driver behind that is the end of the basic warranty coverage. You know, the 336 coverage ends right in the middle of that. And it's when the consumer in many cases says, well, I don't have to go back to the dealer anymore, you know, for oil changes and, and anything because, you know, the car is not covered under under the basic uh, warranty anymore. So now's the time if I'm going to stick my toe in the water of the aftermarket. But if you think about that, I mean, yes, that happens. The end of the warranty is right about when the drop off is in the waterfall chart. But it's not like cars all of a sudden at 35, 36,000 miles start falling apart. They don't. Right. They don't. Okay. It's not like they're running into the aftermarket to go get a bunch of work done or running back to dealers to get a bunch of work done because, you know, they're, as you pointed out, they're better made now than they ever have been. So while the, the end of the warranty is a factor psychologically in the back of their mind because they now know, well, if I need something, I don't necessarily have to go back to the dealer. What we need to be focused on is what is that something that they need? And it's absolutely the first tire replacement. A typical factory set of tires on most cars lasts between 35 and 45,000 miles, which directly coincides with the end of the warranty and is directly in the middle of that drop off in that waterfall chart. So the, the warranty ending is the reason they don't necessarily think of the dealer. But the catalyst, the catalyst for leaving is the tire. And right. we, just, we just need to understand that as an industry. And we don't. That's the thing. Intuitively, I think people do, or they, they everyone that I talk to about it, they hear me say it, and they nod their head, and they go, yeah, Dave, that makes sense. But yet, what are dealers doing differently to try to change it? Every day, I talk to dealers about tires, and every day, I hear the same thing. Oh. Uh, I can't make any money on tires. Oh, they take up so much space in my parts department. Oh, they're dirty. They're messy. Nah, 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 nah. I hear every excuse under the sun not to do tires. And most of those, most of that comes from service managers out there that just haven't wrapped their arms around what the real reason um, to do tires is. And it's got nothing to do with any of that stuff and everything to do with customer retention. If we can... If we can capture that first tire replacement, we are going to have a much better chance of capturing all of that future service work, okay, that we we were betting on was going to come eventually, you know, right. the work that we want to have at the 60, 70, 80, 100,000 miles. We stand a much greater job of chance of keeping the customer through that period. But even more importantly, we stand a much better job of getting the next vehicle purchase because, again, right. we all no longer, we all know the longer we keep them active in service, the better chance we have at selling them another car. So well, David, a customer that completes the service cycle is five times more likely to buy their next car from that dealership, even if they didn't buy the current one they're servicing there. And that's the, and exactly. And that's the message that I'm trying to evangelize with GMs out there. You know, they spend so much money trying to acquire a customer, you know, you know, digital marketing, social media marketing, traditional marketing, they spend tons trying to acquire a customer to sell them a car. 630 some odd dollars per. Exactly. And then they get the customer. And then because they don't think they can make any money on tires, they let the customer leave. And then guess what? In six, seven years, they go and do it all over again because they've got to retain that customer back because they let them slip out of the service department. And, you know, there's lots of things that, that, that dealers need to improve upon in their, in their service operations, but tires is something that is the umbrella for the dealership. It's not just for service. I mean, you know, we could talk all night about you make more money on, you can make money on tires, especially if you're doing alignments and you're doing around the wheel work. And if you're pricing tires properly, you can make money on them. Um, there's that work, but it really is more about the future relationship and the work you can get in the higher mileage bands and then selling the next car that is the real reason for doing this. And I tell dealers this all the time. 
And I'm again, I'm not advocating you give tires away. You don't need to. You can make money on tires, but you need to you need be in the game. game. You, don't need to be, you don't need to be the least expensive. You just need to be in the game. You need to be well in the game. I mean, listen, tires are a competitive commodity. Okay. Everybody's selling them and everybody is trying to make as little bit of money on them. Where dealers get in trouble is they try to make the same kind of money they make on everything else. All right. And, you know, one of the things that I tell people all the time is that if you let your parts manager get involved in this conversation, you're in trouble because he's going to try to drive parts margins that are unrealistic in tires. You just can't make those that kind of money. But that's not the reason to do it. You know, there's another service operation that they don't make a whole lot of money on oil changes. Dealers don't make money on oil changes. They haven't made money on oil changes for years, but they do it for a reason. They do it because it's the trigger for the service visit. It's been the trigger for the service visit forever. So they use it to create service uh, service visits. They use it to create activity. They need to use tires in the same way. Instead of keeping them and getting them to come, we need to keep them from leaving. Um, we need to be using tires as a, as that retention tool so that we can keep them from defecting and taking their work elsewhere. And you, you mentioned, you know, the, the tenure that you spent in the aftermarket. One of the things I love to have dealers do when I'm talking to them is, I tell you know, if, if they're in the dealership and they're sitting at their desk, I say, listen, grab your phone because you know that they got location services turned on and just open up, open up a browser and Google, Google tire shops near me. And you'll find that the typical dealer has 15 or 20 tire shops within 10 miles. Yeah. And that's not by accident. I am fortunate enough. With, and they chase it. I'm fortunate enough with my company that I, I do work for both dealers and the aftermarket. And I spend quite a bit of time in the aftermarket and I sit in their meetings and I listen. And they're part of their marketing plan, you know, is to put their locations right near car dealerships. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's vulture business mentality. You know, they go after the work that the dealers don't want. And that's why they are lo located where they are. Um, and dealers need to understand that if they, if they want to get, get serious about this. And, you know, the last thing I'll say on this, Paul, is that, is that there's lots of reasons to get involved in tires. You can make money in your service department. There's lots of reasons to retain the customer, but the biggest reason is to sell that next vehicle because we have to keep them from defecting. And the data, tons of data out there now says that when they do defect, that's the thing that they're defecting for. It's, it's not anything else. It is the tire. And, you know, the data is powerful. Eight percent, seven, six to eight percent, which means that, you know, 80, you know, 80 to 90% of the people are leaving and not coming back when it comes to tires. Um, and, and once they leave for the tire, then getting them back for anything else other than any, than any powertrain warranty work is a challenge. Even warranty work, half the time they don't want to come back for. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, there's lots of reasons why they don't come back, but we need to find out why they're leaving in the first place. And that's the thing that, you know, we spend, we spend so much money in this industry trying to keep customers happy. You know, we, you know, if we just took 1% of the money that we spend on chasing CSI, 1% of it, and put it towards a tire program that keeps your customers buying tires from you, the, the return would be astronomical. We, 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 we spend money on things, quite frankly, that we don't need to, you know, we, we, you know, we overspend on things. I, I, uh, I, uh, I, this buddy of mine that <clears throat> runs a car dealership here in town or service department here in town, I, I was talking to him, um, a couple of weeks ago, like I mentioned, and he, he was sharing some of his numbers with me. And like a lot of dealers, he's had a pretty decent last couple of months, um, but if you look at his, if you look at his service numbers, they're interesting. His RO counts are still down, his revenues are down, his net profits are way up. Well, why is that? It's pretty simple, right? I Make mean, a better use of their inspections. 
well, their their you know their their revenue is down and their RO count is down. So you know, if Tully would chime in right now, he would say their hours are down because they are. His hours are down, but yet he's making more bottom line profit because he's doing it with a lot less people. You know, they laid off a bunch of people through COVID and they haven't brought many of them back. Right. And I asked him about that. I said, you know, have you, you know, where where do you stand from a staffing perspective? And and he said, well, you know, before COVID, I had 12 porters and now I have five. That 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 give you an example of where we're at. And I said, how many do you need? And he said, five. I said, so you can run your business with five all day long. I said, well, then why did you have 12? And he goes, well, you know my dealer, and I do. I, I know his dealer very well. He said, you know, my dealer is the kind of guy that, you know, when he makes his twice a month visit to the service department, whether he likes it or not, um, if he comes down in the service department and he sees a customer standing there for 30 seconds that hasn't been greeted, he's in my office with his hair on fire telling me to hire more porters. So I'm a good soldier. So I keep hiring more porters. And that's how you end up with 12 when you only need five. It's a perfect example of spending money on something and chasing something that's unnecessary. I mean, we think that dealers are inconvenient places to do business. They're not, particularly when it comes to tires. That's what the customers have the perception that they're more expensive and that they're less convenient when the reality is that it might have been that way in the past. And, and I believe firmly that it was, but that's not the way it, it's been in the last several years. Dealers have the consumers do have the. Let me back up a bit. So one of the one of the I think one of the smartest things I've ever done in my career was um, about eight months ago, we commissioned some consumer research, independent research. I hired a research firm. Highly recommend them. Um, if anybody wants to to know on the side who it was, you know, shoot me a note. I'm happy to share this company's information with you. They did a fabulous job for me. And I learned more probably from this 40 page report that I got back from these guys about our business than I had in the, my previous career. Um, one of the things that I learned about this is that they, we, they don't view the dealer as being inconvenient. They do view the dealer as being very expensive when it comes to tire. And that's well earned because we are in many cases. Again, let the parts manager get involved in this conversation. You're going to be 40, 50 bucks high on every tire you sell. Okay. But they don't necessarily view the dealer as, as any less convenient. The whole thing is, is not very convenient. Listen, when your car breaks down, it's not a convenient thing. When you need to have tires replaced, it's not a convenient thing. And I tell people all the time, if you've never been and serviced a vehicle in the aftermarket, try it. It's not super convenient either. You know, Show up at a show up at a at a discount tire store on a Saturday morning without an appointment. You better bring a thick book because yeah. you're going to be there for hours waiting because right. their processes their processes are no better in many cases worse than dealers. Um, they don't stock any more tires than dealers. Dealers always think, "Oh, I don't have any tires in stock." The aftermarket stocks less tires than most dealers do. This has got nothing to do with all of this stuff. Those things are just excuses. The fact the that we don't stock. What's that? The warehouse is not that far. You can get the tires. You don't need to tie up a lot of real estate. I mean, every OEM tire program is pretty darn good. And you can hot shot a tire within a couple of hours. By the way, that's how the aftermarket does it too. Yeah. You go, you go behind the back wall in a discount tire. You're not going to see a football field full of tires sitting in a warehouse. They carry less SKUs in some cases than dealers do. They carry the fast moving SKUs, which is what, and the common sizes, which is what dealers need to carry. And everything else you need to hot shot and get the customer in and out in a couple of hours. But it's not either of those things. The big, the big driver is price. But the biggest thing is consumers don't believe the dealers actually sell tires. That was the one big thing that we took away from this research project is that 40% of the people that were surveyed absolutely responded to this question with, oh, I didn't know dealers sold tires. That's crazy, right? 40%. 40% said, I didn't know my dealer sold tires. 
Well, how do we earn that reputation? Well, we earn that reputation from you know three decades of telling the customer to go take go do it someplace else. You know, it's it's um, I tell this story to try to make an impression. You know, we it, 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 imagine this. So you're you're heading home for the weekend and you're going to go pick up some food at the grocery store. So you swing into your local grocery store, you pick up a couple of steaks, bottle of wine. You're going to have a good dinner tonight down there on the on the beach, you and your lady, Paul, and you're going to have a nice, nice date night. And you swing into the grocery store and you pick up a couple of steaks, bottle of wine. You figure, well, you're there. You're going to pick up some staples for the house. You get some loaf of bread and you get a, a gallon of milk and and some eggs. And you, you take it up to the counter and you, you go to the counter to check out. And as the stuff is coming down the conveyor belt, the the cashier takes the bottle of milk off the, the, the jug of milk off the uh, counter and off the conveyor. And she puts it down under the counter and she says, you know, Paul, she says, I'm, um, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't sell you. The, I can't sell you the milk. We, we've decided that we're not going to sell milk anymore. We don't, we don't make a lot of money on milk, so we're not going to sell it. Um, happy to sell the steak and the wine because we make a lot of money on that, but we're not going to sell milk. So there's a convenience store right across the street. If you go over there, you can buy your milk there. That's what it's like to try to buy a tire at a car dealership. Yeah. Okay. We give the customer the impression, even the best of service managers, we do this because we we just don't really understand what it really looks like to be in the business. To really be in the business, it starts from the very first service visit. And you know, I could chew up the rest of our time that I'll stop talking about what that process actually looks like. But I can tell you that very few dealers are doing it. Even some of the best service managers that I know are not doing the, all the things they really need to be doing to really be in the tire business. And as a, as a result, we have conditioned customers to go to the convenience store to get their milk. Go to the guy that sells tires for a living to get your tires because I'd rather just do the brake jobs <clears throat> and the other things that I make a lot of money on. If we don't believe that our customers feel that and know that, then you need to read some of this research that I did because they absolutely do. Got to get caught up on a, a bunch of comments here. Jeff Daniel says tires lead to, I don't even know how many dollar signs, but there's a lot of them and repeat business. The OEMs are finally catching on. Tires are the gateway. Before we could, we could throw them away because we had so much other work years ago. But now we don't have that work anymore, so we need to refocus. Uh, we've got Lamont Harris says, hello there. Mike Vogel says, in California, they make us call flushes, fluid exchanges. By the way, Tully and I are not big fans of flushes. Yeah, I was joking about Tully and flushes before. Dean Girdley, they don't get better than David Boyle and all of you, my LinkedIn friends. You know, I'd argue with you if I could, Gene. <laughs> Sully says 100% we would sell them. 100% would we sell them to our families? And John Frazier says do the fluid exchanges when and if the OEM says to. Correct, John Frazier says Mike Vogel, uh, which at Toyota is zip zero nada. Jeff Daniel, like a good slash better slash best oil change that you add goodies to, great way to lose business retention as a dealer. Roger Conant, no pain, no change, unfortunately. And Sean Banks says, great information. Thank you, Jeff Daniels. Mike, that defeated the maintenance plans Toyota threw in a few years ago. Local dealer proceeded to add products as required, cost them some healthy money from Toyota. And Roger Conant says, do you really have a, to stock a bunch of tires to be in the tire? Uh, uh, be a tire resource for the customer. Absolutely not, which David just talked about. And I've seen it myself walking into a lot of these uh, discount tire places. Uh, Mike Vogel says, Roger, a dedicated person works best. Someone that's passionate and knows everything about tires, such as speed rating, ride quality, mileage, warranty, it pencils, as I've done it several times. And Justin Cyril says, hey, what's up, guys? Hey, welcome, Justin. I think this might be your first time on the show. And Jeff Daniel says, Ron Usher, good point. Customers need visuals. And the, you know, the funny thing about tires is like anything else, right? Dealers, when when it's time to cut the, you know, cut the budget and, and tighten the belt, 
training isn't even something that's that's on the radar. And that's something that you need more when you have to cut, you know, when you cut budgets, like you said, David, they spend so much money on so much unnecessary instead of just training their people. If you, from the tire conversation should start at the first visit, at the 30 day, at the 90 day, whatever the first time is the OEM says you need to come in with your car, that's when the first tire conversation needs to start. Because if you train them early and you're going through, and, and I'd like you to talk about some of the technology, because I'm impressed as hell with the technology you guys have that makes it so much easier, right? If you have that conversation up front, if you, if you involve the customer in the walk around and you share with them the data that your company provides them in incredible ways, and you show them, you get them involved. People are visual, right? If they touch the tire and you have that conversation at a thousand miles, and then you have that conversation at 6,000 miles, at 12,000 miles, guess what happens at the end of the 36,000 miles? Way before then, they're asking you, hey, how are my tires? Because now you've educated them to the process. You've gotten used to thinking about tires. And at this point, they know full well you are in the tire business. And it's no different with, you know, like I said, they don't make oil, money on oil changes either, but yet they bring them in like cattle, right? But how often do they do a walk around in the quick lane? How often do they convert that oil change only to a 15,000 mile service to include the rotation and all the other stuff? So it's, it's you know, it, it's so, all getting them the use of the conversation. Yeah. So you touched on our, our product and our technology a little bit. I'm going to, you know, I don't want this to be a commercial, so I'm going to talk about it in more general sense. So one of the reasons that we developed the, the products that we've got is the knowledge that we gained by looking at this industry, looking at the tire, the current process that most dealers have. And again, this consumer research that we did, we learned several valuable things. And one of the things that we learned is that the, the tire conversation needs to be done during the write-up, not as part of the MPI. It's, it's just, that's not the right place for it. And listen, I'm an MPI guy. I mean, I, I was, I was one of the founders of one of the companies that started digital inspections. I believe in MPIs, but I also believe that the MPI in terms of the being the Holy grail in terms of helping dealers dramatically grow their revenue is somewhat run its course. There's just not a lot of stuff to inspect anymore. And consumers know that. And they, 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 the, 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 the reaction that many consumers have to the MPI. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to get some enemies here on this because I know a lot of guys are big believers in it, but the reaction that consumers have to it, and I don't care whether you're doing this with video or whatever, is still one of your being upsold. Consumers know that word upsell. Figure, swallow that one for a minute. Most consumers know that word and they reference that word. And to them, it's a dirty word because they, they view, uh, the dealer's is always trying to sell me something. Whenever I come in, he's always trying to sell me something. Why? Because we are. We have for years. We don't actually get serious about MPIs until about 35, 40,000 miles. Why? Because there's nothing to do in the first 30,000 miles. So we do a cursory view at best. We don't give customers inspection results, results that are all green. We have to, you know, and I'm generalizing here, some dealers do, but most dealers, even to this day, don't do a good job at presenting the all green. And then, you know, the whole concept was green, 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 yellow, yellow, red. You know, it for us, it's just oh, red. You know, we need it now. Green, you got to sell the green to build the trust. Tires are a very visual thing. If you think about a tire, other than insurance and gasoline, it's probably the most expensive thing that the consumer is going to spend over the lifetime lifetime of a vehicle. You know, hundred thousand miles is at least three sets of tires. Okay, on most cars. Um, and you know, you add that together, it's going to be probably right up there in terms of the most amount of money that they're going to spend. You know, the big ticket repairs, engines need to be replaced. Transmissions need to be replaced are becoming a thing of the past, right? Are a thing of the past. So tires are 
in the customer's mind, a, an expensive proposition. And they're a very competitive proposition. So the get the car in for one thing, take it in the shop, do a multi-point, and then the technician gives you the inspection and the service advisor calling back the customer and saying, hey, you know, I noticed when your car was in for our inspection that you need, you know, your front tires replaced. It reeks of they're trying to sell me something um, that I don't need. You need to be able to show the customer, which is why this process works better on the drive. And the reason that we developed the tools that we did was trying to get service advisors, porters, whoever, to stick tires on the drive is hard, okay? Service drives are busy places. Even if you're a small store, they're busy places. And with most vehicles today, it is a very dirty and difficult process to try to do it. And I I have another, you know, sort of personal story that I had on this. This was this was before I had gotten right before I we we launched a, a, a TPI and I had a car um I had a BMW at the time and I took it into a BMW dealer and I knew the rear tires were junk cuz I had been under the car and looked at them. So I brought it into the dealership uh, I'm not going to name the dealership because that wouldn't be fair. Um, but I brought it into a very large, well-known dealership <laughs> in Dallas. And I took it in for, I think it was my 40,000 mile service. And um, I asked the service advisor, hey, could you check my tires for me? Oh, yeah, sure. And he walked around the car and this is what he did. He took these things. This is his stick gauge. I called him the, I, I called him the educated fingernails. Oh my he, took, God. he took these things and he stuck it in the outside groove of all four tires. Now, why did he do this? Okay, this was an M5. Okay, it's low to the ground. Most cars are low to the ground nowadays. Okay, and you know, getting your hand or a stick gauge or a penny or whatever you want to use to measure the tread on the inside of most cars is hard. Now, I know there's a lot of guys out there that are going to say, well, you just turn the front wheels. Well, that'll get the front wheels, but how are you going to get the back wheels? Lay down on your side and crawl underneath the car um, and get your new white shirt tie all dirty? Yeah. It doesn't, it, 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 there's, listen, there are too many reasons not to do it properly, which is why we developed the tools that we did. We're not, again, we're not one of these people that are trying to replace service advisors. Um, don't worry, John Frazier, it's not, we're not, you know, we're not the kiosk guys. We're trying to, uh, oh, yeah. No, we're, 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 we're trying to support service advisors um, because I want to give them the data quickly and accurately without them having to get their hands dirty, get their shirts dirty, lay down the side on their side in some cases to get under the back of a car. Needless to say, the you know the rear tires on this M5 were showing cords on the inside. Anybody that's ever owned or worked on a BMW knows what I'm talking about. The cords were hanging out on the inside and the outer tread was like new. You know, all that positive rear camber, all right, was causing those things to wear funky on the inside, which every BMW does. And, you know, again, here I took my car into a dealership, a very reputable dealership, and I have a service advisor telling me my tires are fine. Yeah, no problem. Your tires are great. Um, of course, I pushed the issue and I said, are you sure? And he goes, yeah, there's lots of tread left on him. And I said, look underneath. And he got down on one knee and he's like, oh, and his eyes got big. And so, I mean, how often does that happen in dealers? It happens way more often than we want. And I listen, I know there's service managers out there that think that they can make this process work. You, you can. How long is it going to stick is my question. Okay. And how hard do you have to push to get your people to do it? And have it stick and have it stick consistently. And for relatively a little bit of money, you can have a piece of technology that will do it all for you and then some. It'll create a wonderful visual um, videos and stuff to help explain to the customer what's needed um, and all the things that will help support a better selling process on the drive. And it does it in less than two seconds um, you know, when you drive in, drive into the service drive so that no customer ever gets missed. Um, because that's the other thing, you know, there are service managers out there that some of them are friends of mine that have said, no, I, I, you know, we stick every car. No, you don't. Right. 
you, you, you stick the ones that your service advisor thinks that there may be a need based on mileage and based on looking at the history. You're not sticking every car. I've stood in service drives and watched it. I have service managers tell me, yeah, we stick every car. I'm like, okay, yeah, great. I'm going to go watch that process. Then I grab my iPhone and I, and I videotape cars leaving in and out, porters, bag tagging, car leaving. Not one tire get, get, had a stick gauge put on it. And, what and like about, well, what I like about your system, okay, I like the fact that it, it sends that information onto the customer automatically. Yeah, because I mean, what I see is a lot of guys, even when they have machines that give them all that data, I'd say a fair percentage of the time, it's it's the porter that's taking that car in, not a service advisor, and they're not sharing that that data with the customer when it's important for them to do. Well, that certainly does happen. The, the, there's a there's a, a reason that we did it this way, though. I mean. Part of it was to make sure that every customer got it because you're right. I mean, some of that information doesn't get into the hands of the customer. I physically watched service advisors in the early days of, 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 of tire profiles where we were just producing a printed report, which we don't print anything anymore. I mean, everything's electronic and digital now to the customer. But in the early days when we were printing things, I've watched service advisors get the report, look at it, and then put it in the trash. And I would go up to the guy and I would ask them, why are you doing that? So I know this customer, they won't spend any money on tires. Okay. Um, not even a, that one doesn't even deserve a conversation. But I know that happens. But, th th but that's not the real reason we did it, Paul. The real reason we did it actually is that there's a, there's a layering to the selling process on tires that is very critical that everybody needs to understand. It isn't one of those... Oh, I need an oil change. Yeah, go ahead and do it while it's here. Type conversations. It's not. It never will be because it's typically at a price point where somebody's going to have to think about it a little bit. And what we've learned is that there's layers to this process. So by scanning the car the minute they don't show in on the on the, they arrive on the drive and sending it right to the consumer, you know, with a text message on their smartphone, they click on that text message, they get taken to our e-tread tracker report which is fully dynamic. They can click on it. They can watch videos and animations to learn what a contact patch is. And if we're recommending an alignment, it tells them why we should get an alignment. doesn't talk anything about toe and camber, which customers couldn't care less about anyway. Um, but it takes all that information and it sends it to the customer. And again, we're not trying to replace the service advisor here because the customer is not going to make the decision just solely based on this text message. I call this the tenderizing phase. This is this is when you can't afford a T-bone and you get a crappy piece of meat, okay, and you marinate it for two days, okay? We're marinating the customer, okay? We're giving the customer information so that they can look at it. They can educate themselves a little bit. It's fully transparent. You know, this is their car telling them what's needed. It's not coming from you yet. So the guard is down, which is what the consumer wants. They want to be involved in the process. They want full transparency. So they have all this information. And the goal is, is that by the time they get to the service advisor to go through the write-up process, they're already in the mindset of, oh, I need tires. He's going to tell me about tires. All right. And they're already more open to it. Yes. They're already more open to it. The other thing that doing it second david not to cut you off i i yep. we're getting a little behind on the on the comments so let me just run a couple of these robert sebastian tire conversation should start at sales service walk hi guys and he says new clients in the service drive or from sales should get a tire keychain hey that's interesting i've never seen a tire <clears throat> keychain uh, jeff daniel says we need to make it as simple as going to costco Look at, touch them, get a pizza slice, and buy four tires with a free alignment check. Mike Vogel says, Ron Usher, agree on video slash pics of tires with explanations. Uh, prep the customer at yellow so they're ready to buy their next visit. Plus, they understand we're in the tire business. Now, I would, I like that. And my the conversation I like to have uh, in, in talking about how to get them thinking tires I like to talk about stopping distance and what a particular distance is, okay? So if, I'm, if my tires are in the yellow, I want the service advisor to tell me that my tires are good 
I want the service advisor to advise me that when the tires are new, it takes this far, that takes my car this long to stop. I want him to tell me that when my tires are in the condition they are now in yellow, it takes this far to stop. And just letting you know, probably by the next time you come in for service, you'll be at the next stage, which will take this far to stop. That conversational is something that people can understand and, and it's less of a sell and more of uh, an education. Uh, so we got, hold on a second, we got, um, uh, let's see here. Ron Usher says, customers are in a rush all the time. If you have the parts, they will most likely do them. Mark Williamson says, Paul, are you in the cargo bay of the Millennium Falcon? Bet it would hold a lot of tires. <laughs> There's a reason for this, Mark, and you'll understand this in, within the next couple of months. That's all I'm going to say. As Steve Chesson says, if the customer doesn't sign a refusal and, God forbid, have an accident, the liability issue is important. Steve Apicella says the selling dealer is best equipped to service their customers' tires or any other maintenance, whether scheduled or not. The missing link is the lack of focus of not earning the long-term customer at the point of sale, where many times the auto sales, I'm going to scroll this, the auto sales industry is exclusively focused on selling the car. Our industry's retention rate for any type of maintenance, including tires, is embarrassingly poor because of this simple premise. If we embrace the customer on the front end more, um, and then it, it, it cut off there, but yeah, you know, the, I guess the best visual, if somebody really wants to take this to heart, take 100 items and put 93 of them on one side and put seven of them on, on the other side, and that seven, that's your slice of the pie. That's insane. Didn't mean to cut you off, but I didn't want to get too far in the No, and, and that's fine. And like everyone has said in there, I mean, there's a, there is an entire process that we, we could spend an hour just talking about this, that, that is part of what my company helps dealers do. And it is like someone said, it's from that very first service visit. If you do a service walkthrough orientation, you should be talking about what you do to sell tires. I can tell you that, you know, putting a few tires on display in your service drive, that isn't going to get it done. Okay, that's all that stuff that's hanging out in your service drive is white noise to the customer. They don't even see it. It's about what your service advisor does as part of that engagement. And it should be from day one. We have a saying at TPI and that's sell the green. Um, and you got to be selling the fact that the tire is green and then goes yellow. We have we are promoting something in the industry that is a bit of a wild card. We've, we are recommending to dealers that they need to add a fourth color when it comes to tires, um, that the traditional red, yellow, green in an inspection isn't good enough for tires, that you need to add a fourth color, and that fourth color is orange, and orange is between yellow and red. So it's at the bottom end of yellow, but it's not quite red yet. And why that is important is with the service intervals getting longer and longer, and we're seeing customers less and less. We need to be engaging the customer earlier on in the process. If we wait until the fact that their tires are already red, right. we've already likely lost the opportunity. They've already made a decision to go someplace else. So the trigger to start talking about when they need tires is at the bottom end of yellow. And it's hard to get the dealers to wrap their head around selling yellow. So we've come up with this new color, which is not quite red, not quite yellow, orange. Um, and it's that last... 32nd of yellow. And that's when, you know, that's the moment of truth. That's when you need to be engaging the consumer and you need to be having conversations with them about the upcoming need in, you know, 30, 60, 90, 120 days or whatever on when they're going to need tires. And you need to be convincing them that you're the place to do that. To that end, one of the other sort of features that are part of our, our program is something that we call the predictive wear indicator, which is brand new. Nobody's ever done anything like this before. And, and what we've done is utilize the power of data to be able to predict when someone is going to need tires. And we use measurements. We use RO data. We get that through our integrations with the DMS providers. 
we know the vehicle of obviously through our license plate recognition, we get the VIN, we get the plate, we get the VIN, we get the year, make, model, we get all the RO history. We use all that information, including the type of vehicle, the type of tire, where they are in the country in terms of where, where patterns. And we've developed an AI of sort that, that takes all of that information, jumbles it all together and comes up with a predictive timeline for every car. So every car that's in the dealer's database, 10,000, 20,000 cars, we have a projected tire replacement date. And why that's important is we can't just be reactionary anymore. We can't wait for the customer to come in and need something because the reality is they're coming in a lot less than they used to be. So if we want to get back, really get back and get 20, 30% of that replacement market share, we need to be targeting our owners that are out there driving around and have reached orange and need to have their tires replaced. And we need to put our, go ahead. Proactive messaging because yes. because orange tire in the northeast here that's the front wheel drive car that's not going to be able to make it up the hill in the snow even though there's still some traffic. Right, but it's it is proactive, but it's it it's very targeted, you know, because we're using very act what becomes very accurate information. So we're able to send a very targeted strategic message to each consumer right when there's a really good chance based on the way this, the data works, that they have a need. So we're not, you know, we're not relying on, you know, every OEM still sends out quarterly tire mailers, buy three, get one free. And, you know, 90% of those mailers go right in the trash because 90% of the people don't have a need when that mailer lands on their desk. It's nice. We need to be able to, we need to be smarter than that. We need to be better than the aftermarket when it comes to this. We have all of this data. We need to use this data to target market to these customers. And we need to be having them come back in for a complimentary inspection, have them drive back over our stuff so we can remeasure the tire so that we throw our arms around them and say, no, you're my customer and I'm going to take care of you. I'm not going to give you an opportunity to go into, into the aftermarket. I'm going to take care of you. And we're going to use intelligence and we're going to use data to be able to do that. We're going to drive these customers back. So part of the, the software that we provide has a tool to market to these customers so that we can get a dealer message in front of these customers when we know they have the need before they make a decision to go somewhere in the aftermarket. It's okay, so, saying, so powerful. So it's dealer branded without having to rely on somebody at the dealership to get involved. Yeah. I mean, it's so, I mean, you can have somebody at the dealership. I mean, the database that we have can feed a, a BDC. It can feed, it can feed an outsourced BDC. It can, it can feed, you know, a, a marketing company that, 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 that you want to send, you know, to send some sort of a marketing message, you know, or it can produce a, a phone list to have a service advisors make phone calls. The reality is, you know, it's five or six phone calls a day. Somebody's got to make. Um, right. because, you know, if you look at the size of the database, I mean, if you're calling people every day, because the way this thing gets very targeted, it gets down to the day. So right. even if you have 20,000 records, you know, in your, in your, in your, in your DMS, each day, there is a handful that are in this, what we call the open loop when it comes to predictive wear. That means that they're in the window and we need to communicate with them in some fashion now, uh, whether that be pick up the phone and call them, whether that be send that information over to some third party that sends them, you know, a, a snail mail or an email or a text message uh, or whatever. Um, we've got to engage the consumer now because this is how we keep them from going elsewhere. If we just let them continue to slide along, the guy, the guy with the tire sign on the side of his building. Okay. The guy that's got tires in his name, discount tire, Mavis tire, you know, national tire and battery, the guys that have tire in their name. Okay. Are going to win more than their fair share of the business. So as dealers, we need to work harder and smarter. We need that use information and data to be able to put our message in front of the customer and make sure that they know that we do tires and that we are the right place to get it done. We know more about their vehicle. We know about what type of tire that should be put back on their vehicle. 
um, you know, we could spend a half an hour talking about making sure we get the right tires back on vehicles, which is a huge opportunity for dealers to be leveraging that knowledge right. um, that we don't take that we don't take enough uh, don't take enough advantage of. No, I totally agree. They had a couple of comments here. Robert Sebastian says, with longer intervals, many will go to orange from orange to red prior to the next service. Uh, Jeff Daniels, it's all about planting the seeds financially and safety wise. Yeah, you know what? Because if, if we're educating them and if we're having the conversation throughout, you know, they can start budgeting and planning for the tire that's going to be needed predictably at a certain period of time. So, yeah, that's a great thing. Uh, Michael Larkin says, I still use oil, the oil change sticker. What about tire sticker letting the customer know when to change their tires? That's an interesting concept. Hadn't thought of that. We Our, do. We, we do the digital version of that. Yeah. You know, it's um, I don't know. I think some people are still using, you know, oil change stickers um, and. I get it. I don't know how well they work anymore, to be honest with you, but there's a, there's a more, you know, 2020 way to do that. <laughs> right, right. That's do it digitally. Yeah. Um, and we do a digital version of that. So when we, every time a customer comes in and we scan their car and they get this report and they can still get it printed, by the way, some people still like pr paper, yeah. but the majority of them are sent digitally. Now the majority of them are sent electronically they get it on their smartphone on we use that same database this is the this is the oil change sticker concept we use that same predictive engine that's predicting when their tires are going to wear out we put their wear out date on that report and every time they come in it changes right. because because every time they come in and we get another data point we okay. recalculate you know we recalculate they make a long trip then that that projected date moves up because they just, you know, took a cross country trip. You know, yeah. COVID hits and the car's been sitting in the garage for three months. That date gets pushed out further into the into the future, right? So right. interval certainly extended from the, over the last six months. Right. So that projected date moves around every time we get another data point, whether it be a a, a tire scan or a, an RO or or whatever. For both, we get another data point. That data gets projected, and that projection date, that replacement date, gets inked on the top of that report in 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 bold text that says, "This is the date that we predict that you're going to need to replace these tires." And that starts from visit one, from when the tire is green and brand new. We are projecting when that tire is likely going to wear out, so the customer can see it. Their attention's called to it. The service advisor can call their attention to it on every visit so that it's always out there. So they've got time to plan for it. They can prepare for the expense because it is one of those expenses that a lot of consumers are going to want to prepare for because it's not, this is not talking about. Depending on the car. Easily. It can be. Yep, it can be. It ties sure. into, um, you know, Robert says, Michael Larkin, brilliant idea. But yeah, the digital is always on your phone. So you have that report. It tells them that you're in the tire business. And you know what? If you communicate it more as a safety item and how it affects their, their handling and performance, as opposed to selling them something, nobody wants to be sold, but everybody wants to be taken care of. Um, Jeff Daniel said it would be great if a high tech, if as high tech as cars are getting now, the vehicle sends the alert to the consumer just like it does for an oil change or a maintenance service. But that sounds like what you're doing now. Well, um, we're doing it. We're doing it, it. It looks like it's coming from the car, but it's not coming from telematics. The, the, listen, there is a, there will be a day. I may, I may see it. I may not. <laughs> when there's a sensor that's affordable um, that can go inside of the tire, I, they're working on it. They've been working on it for years. It's a little bit different than, than, than tire pressure. Right. Um, you know, putting a sensor inside the wheel to measure the pressure inside a tire is relatively simple. Maybe putting yeah. something, putting something in the mold so that you can measure tread while the car is moving down the road. Um, listen, we are one of the companies that's working on it. So, um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. So I can tell you that, uh, it's, um, it's a long way away. 
Um, it would they, be wonderful if it did that. That's okay. Star, that Star Trek stuff. Or well, I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it's certainly cutting edge, cutting edge. And like I said, we're one of the companies that have been prototyping this. We've had a we've had a, a Skunk Works project going now for two years that we've been playing around with these types of things. And there's a number of companies out there that are that are working on this, but most of it that's being done right now is very, very early stage. And there's going to be two problems with that. One is getting something that works and then also is getting something that's affordable. Right. Okay. Because you got to remember, this is not likely going to go on the vehicle. This is going to go in the tire, inside right. the tire. Um, and, you know, if you got something that adds $15, $20, $40 to the price of every tire, um, you know, then, then it, it starts to become... It, it gets to be a cost justification thing, but on the high end. Yeah, we we believe we do the next best thing with our technology because again, the technology is completely touchless, and you know it's the it's the car or the technology that's communicating this information, not necessarily you know anybody from the dealership or the technician, and then the service advisor is just reinforcing that information, and it's that sort of one two punch um, that is that allows our dealers that use our product to, you know, see huge increases in business and not just from tires, you know, this right. same dealership that the same dealership that I keep referencing that my, my buddy works at um, here in town is a customer. Um, and the lift that they've seen in alignments and tires is staggering. They're up over 400% in alignments alone, 400%. A hundred percent. Yep. They're up over 400% in alignments and over 200% in tires. And the other interesting thing is if you look at brake rotors, brake pad replacements, and, and, and other around the wheel work, they're all up triple digits since yeah. they started with us. Because you have the um, to take the wheel off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's just, it's a consistent process that happens every time. That's one of the beauties of technology that it happens every time. But we are providing tools that are going to empower service advisors and service managers to have a better process. And we're empowering the consumer by giving you know them sort of control, if you will, over the decision-making process. And all of that combines to you know, a process that very quickly and very easily, this is the part I love most about my company and my, my products, is that these are so easy to get going and so easy to get installed. Very quickly, first month, with very little effort, you can see a substantial lift in tire and alignment sales, um, which is what you know, which is obviously what we were shooting for when we when we started the company. So but that's what the dealers want. You know, think of it as the the TO process at a dealership is invaluable, right? A salesperson can spend all this time talking to somebody to a customer, and a customer won't budge. Somebody else comes in, a manager could be another salesperson that says, "Hey, I'm the manager." They say the exact same words, with <coughs> a different voice, and that customer says, "You know what? Okay, I'll I'll take it." And and the deal is made, and that salesperson is scratching his head, like, "Wait, I told them the same thing. How come they bought from you? It's not that they bought from you per se. That other person just reinforced it. So when they get the data from a neutral party, if you will, data is data. The great thing I love about data is it's it's apolitical. It doesn't have any kind of agenda. It's data." They can understand data if properly communicated, and that the service advisor that builds the relationship with that customer can effectively reinforce that conversation to make that sale. So we got a hey. couple more things here. Mark Williamson says good stuff. Roberts has introduced the service and parts as the X brand time tires, brakes, and factory service center. The age is critical, also. And Michael Larkin says thanks, Robert Sebastian. I believe that is in response to the tire sticker comment. Adam Dennis, welcome. Nobody wants to be sold, but everybody wants to be taken care of. Thank you. I think I just said that. Spot on quote, Paul. The easier you make it for customers, the more likely they will do business with you. And Jeff Daniel says, wheel well scanning. It's coming. Coming to a dealership near you. Michael Larkin says, thanks, Paul and David. Learned a lot as always. And Dan Stedham, David, great information and show stars of lightning. So, Matt, I, we ran over a little bit, and, and this is one of those conversations, David. I thank you so much. You brought some great value to the show, and we could literally spend the next five hours and not do more than scratch the surface of this conversation. 
That is that is true. That is true. What you do is if you could in the comment section, please put uh, how somebody would get a hold of you. Maybe links to your website because sure. the videos you have on there are really, really pretty interesting stuff. And I'm sure that somebody may want to reach out to you. Might have a couple of questions. I want to thank my audience as always. Uh, you guys are are turning this show into something really, really valuable here. And Jeff Daniels, that's great conversation. Thanks, Paul and David. So if you found value in this show, you work at a dealership, you have friends at a dealership, and you think that this is something that might benefit them in the area of retention, by all means, please share this uh, episode with your automotive community on LinkedIn or Facebook, wherever it is that uh, your community resides. And uh, as always, thank you very much for watching. Oh, we didn't play the video. You want to play the video or not? Uh, you know what? I just put up there uh, my email. Anybody has any questions, email me uh, directly. Um, but I've also put a link to our website. That video is on our website. So people can go wow. take a look at it there. Great. So again, thank you very much. We'll see you next week on Sunday Night Live. And let's see here. Where is the... There you go. All right. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks, Pete.